meeting you right where you are on your foster care journey. This is The Forgotten Podcast. Hello and welcome to The Forgotten Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Cabe, and I am so happy to be with you. If you are part of the foster care community, passionate about serving, or simply interested in learning more, we are here for you. In every episode of this podcast, you will hear stories from men and women who have experienced foster care to one degree or another. They may have grown up in the system, are caseworkers, foster parents, or others who are here to bring you hope or encouragement. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe and share it with a friend. And remember, you are not alone. I hope you enjoy the Forgotten Podcast. Let's just start right in with your journey. And I would just love to hear, I know that your story is is one where you have been sober for over five years now. And your husband and you were separated. Now you have gotten back together, right? So I would just love to hear some background. Like, let's talk about the period of time when you got married way back in 2016, and it kind of caused this trigger effect of him relapsing, you relapsing. Like, let's just kind of start there and talk about where you've come from. So I, when my husband and I, we've been on and off for quite some time now, but Mm -hmm. this last time when we got married, it, it stuck. We were together. I had four years of recovery at that moment. He was in his going into his second year. Okay. And I got pregnant from the youngest for Micaiah. And for him, that was a lot because the other two are not his. Okay. Though he has played dad's, the dad role since my 12 year old, my now 12 year old was one. Mm. Um, it's different when it's your own. Mm. And when you have backgrounds like we do, um, his background is he has another son, not in this relationship that was controlled for him. He wasn't allowed to make decisions. He wasn't allowed Mm. to see this child without um, doing what that mother wanted to do. Mm. So he had a huge fear of it happening to him again. And so that triggered his relapse. And he, for a period of time, was able Mm. to to go out and use without me catching on without Hmm. without me stumbling which was his goal he didn't want to pull me down Hmm. but he was struggling and couldn't really talk about it um once i caught him i had it happened a couple of times where i caught him we would fight and argue about it and then it just literally got to this point where i said okay if this is what we're doing we're doing it together Knowing full well that I didn't think at the time, I I didn't think that if I went out and relapsed that I was going to make it back Mm, because of the relapses before. But I made the choice to do that anyways. Mm. We used for a few months um, right after I had Micaiah. It was literally right after I had Micaiah that I relapsed. And we started rapidly going downhill. Hmm. Bills started not getting paid. Um, And Brent was doing things that he shouldn't be doing to get money, like stealing and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Now, he was on a program called FSU, which is pretty much you're incarcerated, but you're allowed to live on the streets. Hmm. With that, if you get any charges, no matter how small they are, you stay in jail and you are not able to bail out. Hmm. We got caught with stolen property in the house. Um, and he went to jail immediately and court process takes a long time. So he ended up being there for a good year, a little over a year Hmm. that left me with three kids, a house behind in bills and using Hmm. drugs. So I just kept using, um, I ended up being evicted, came to a to a, an agreement to be able to stay there through Christmas and and leave without having such an impact on my rental history that I wouldn't get another place. Hmm. And I found another place. It should have been a fresh start, hmm. but it wasn't. I kept using while he he was incarcerated and people had called DCF. Hmm. 
that there was too many people in my house, in and out traffic. Um, the school had called with concern because with him being in jail, I had the vehicle that I had was not working. And I had three kids that had to go to three different schools oh, wow! all at the same time. And so they were consistently about 15 minutes late. Mm hmm. And so this between the school calling and other people calling, I had gotten a phone call that DCF wanted to speak to me, just wanted to talk, come to the house, you know, and I sat down with with a, a worker at the time. Now, the worker that came to my house was somebody I knew personally. He was my son's case manager for Head Start, and they had mm. a really close relationship. So I think in my mind... I didn't think anything was going to come of it because he knew me. He knew my backstory. Mm -hmm. He knew sure. a lot. And I continued to do what I was doing. I kept using because I would just want to, I didn't want to feel sure. anything. And it just kept getting worse, kept getting worse, kept getting worse. I wanted to not feel what I was feeling. And it just kept pulling me worse and worse. Mm -hmm. And let me ask this. And by the way, I really appreciate your openness and, and being willing to share your story um, and the harder parts of your story. So thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. It sounds like, yeah, can you help us like kind of get even more into your head at that time where when you started using again, it was, you kind of mentioned it's like, if he's doing it, we're just going to kind of do this together. Like, is there, and he, fear is kind of what triggered him. And then when you start, you probably, like you said, feel things like that you don't want to feel. And so then you, is it that you just want to keep numbing it? Is that kind of what's going through your head in those times of like why you keep going back to it? So initially when I made the decision to relapse, it was more of a twisted mentality. Mm. I... Growing up, I didn't know much about drugs until I actually started doing drugs. My, mm. It wasn't anywhere in my family. My parents never sat down, had a conversation with me mm. about it. So my head and my beliefs and my values were so twisted that in my mind, if he's going to use, I want to be in the same mentality. I want to be in the state, same set of mind mm. that he was. It was more of a we're going to do it together or we're not going to do it kind of, mm -hmm. of thought process. Once he was arrested, it stopped being that mm -hmm. and became, I don't want to be afraid. Mm -hmm. He's not, you know, the fear of him not being there to help with the kids or yeah. feeling awful that he's in jail. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's also mental health issues and there's there's yeah. traumas in the past. Absolutely. And so the, these things come up mm. periodically in everybody's lives. I didn't have coping skills to deal with them. Mm -hmm. So my way of always dealing with any sort of anything that's uncomfortable or too much emotionally for me, my go-to has always been to get high because when mm. I am high, I'm, I can't think about those things. Yeah. I, I'm just an completely escape. numb. Yeah. And I and I can at least function in a day without being an absolute emotional wreck. Hmm. Wow. That's a hard that's a it's a very powerful pull, isn't it? Yeah. Hmm. It's easy to be numb. Yeah. It's very easy to be numb. It's very hard to have to sit and feel awful feelings that nobody wants hmm. to feel. Yeah especially like you said, when you don't, you don't really know another way. Like you didn't have the coping mechanisms to help. Right. Mm. I imagine that's an incredibly hopeless place to be. Yeah. It's a bad cycle. I mean, it's a vicious cycle It that just, it doesn't end unless and until you find other ways to get through the situation. Yeah. So Tiffany, you said the DCFS had come and you kind of thought things were going to be fine, but ultimately there was a day when DCFS came in and took the children. Can we, yeah. can we talk about that day? So that day was what 
I would have considered to be just like any other day that was had been going on. I woke up with the idea and mentality that I was going to hustle and do what I do to get high because that was my existence. Mm. Um, I don't remember if it was a school day or not for the kids at this point. Um, but I, I definitely didn't wake up or expect that to be the case. The kids had asked me if I'd, I had let another family come stay at the house. They also had a daughter about my daughter's age, heaven. And they had asked me if would, they could take the sectional couch and make it into one big bed. And I had said, yeah, that's fine, whatever, because at that point, I didn't really much care. I mm. just wanted to be left alone to do what I was doing. Um, I spent most of my day running, running the streets, mm. getting money, selling drugs to this person so I could get the drugs that I wanted. Mm. And that's pretty much what my day consisted of. Um, dinner time came. I told them after dinner that I would make the bed for them that they'd wanted. For dinner, it pretty much was just random crap. It wasn't an actual meal like they should mm-hmm. have had. Mm-hmm. Um, I made the bed. I put the coffee table in my son's room upside down because the last time I had done that, he used it to jump off of and do wrestling moves. <laughs> and so to be safe, I tried to flip it upside down. DCF waited until after 10 o'clock to come. Wow. Wow. Um, I had gotten them settled down and let them lay in this bed. Micaiah was an infant and she had, she wasn't sleeping in her own bed or her own crib. She would only sleep in the big bed with me. Hmm. So she was sleeping there and I had pretty much locked myself between the bathroom or the, or the bedroom to do my drugs that I was doing. And somebody had told me that there was uh, a cop and some people with badges at the door so when I answered the door, I realized what it was and who it was, and I refused to open it for a good hour, arguing with them, demanding to see the paper that they had, and telling them they're not coming in. And at this point, the kids had woken up, except for Micaiah. And they wore me down to, to the point of letting them in to talk, hmm. uh, at which point they showed me the paper that they had to take the kids And basically, there was nothing I could do. I spent the time continuing to argue, to reason. Um, Instead of packing, instead of helping the kids pack things that they they need, like a mom should, you know, making Mm -hmm. sure they have the things that that they're going to want or need. I was too busy arguing with them. Um, So one of the friends that I had had over were helping to get some clothes and, and asking the kids what they wanted. And calling my dad, I called my dad. He he was alive at the time. He's not now. Telling him they're taking the kids, expecting that he's going to do something. Um, my daughter talked to him, told him. I mean, that was her everything hmm. for so long. Telling him that she's not going to go. She told DCF she was not going to go. She argued with them like she was a little adult. How old was she at this time? Oh, God, she's 14 now, going okay. on 15. So probably about somewhere between 10, 10 and 12. Okay, wow. Um, so they had grabbed some stuff. They had grabbed Dad's T-shirt because that's always been a thing in this house. Every one of the kids needs a shirt. He wears three shirts a day, mm. always, so that by the time he gets done doing what he's doing, they each get one that he wore that day. Mm. So they all had grabbed the shirt that they had and a stuffed animal and a couple of things. And I got some stuff ready for Micaiah and they let me walk them down the stairs the whole time. Heaven's arguing and telling them how mm. she's not going. They're crying. They're devastated. They wouldn't let me wake Micaiah up um, because she was sleeping. But she woke up while I was buckling her car seat into the car Mm -hmm. and she started screaming. As soon as she woke up, she realized something was wrong because mom was crying and the two kids next to me are crying. And Mm -hmm. and so they were very, very upset and scared and devastated. Mm. I can't even imagine. Yeah. Hmm. So after they left, 
it every it kind of I stayed until the car left and then I went back upstairs and attempted to use the rest of everything that I had Hmm. because anything was better than that yeah Hmm. I'm sorry it still brings up a ton of emotion doesn't it yeah What, what, how, what happens next in that situation? I had kept, I spent the next like four or five days just absolutely obliterated. Mm. So to be honest, I don't know Mm -hmm. much of what happened in those days. I didn't sleep. Um, I ended up falling asleep in my apartment somewhere. And, um, because I, my body just couldn't stay awake any longer. Yeah. And I spent the rest of the time waiting while Brent was incarcerated. Just doing that. Staying completely out of my mind. Mm. Wasted. So that I didn't have to deal with, deal with it. Yeah. So, uh, it, you know, time went on. And at this point... It sounds like you weren't like doing anything to try to pursue getting them back because you were in such this no. place of despair, right? Yeah, no. I did nothing for months and months and months. A house ended up getting robbed in one of the stupors I was in. They took uh, some of my son's gaming stuff and TV, and I spent spent less and less time at the house because I just didn't want to be there in Mm. more time at somebody else's house, the next street over, there Mm. was a legitimate path between the two houses because they were one street behind each other. Mm. And, uh, even though I found out that they had everything to do with my house getting robbed, Mm. I still stayed there and I still engaged with them and used with them because they were helping to keep, me wasted yeah served a purpose so i literally continued to use right up until the tpr yes which is termination of parental rights when they're talking adoption now for the kids yes and so what how did this impact you when you heard about that I did the same. I went to, right back to the same pattern. I mean, I was already using. So when they told me about the TPR, I, um, it was another four or five days of being wasted. Um, I ended up at my dad's house. Um, no, the TPR was shortly after Brent got out. So yeah, I, I repeated the same pattern of just I need to be wasted. I don't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. I can't deal with it emotionally. So I'm going to just do what I'm doing. And I spent, I was running streets, selling drugs, buying drugs, using drugs, Mm. all sorts of crazy situations that I have put myself in. Well, today though, you've been sober for over five years. So something connected something made a shift like tell us about when things started to turn for the positive so when brent got out um i was supposed to bail him out (laughs) the day that fsu ended for him he was eligible to be bailed out and i took the money and got high instead Mm -hmm. um so he found a way to get out and located me Hmm. i did not want to be located (laughs) um I remember waking up behind my father's recliner at my dad's house. I don't know why. I don't even remember going there. Um, To my phone blowing up and it being him. Very Mm. frustrated that I did not bail him out. And (laughs) where was I? What was I doing? And uh, my dad, my brother, and the kids all had this idea in their head that Brent's going to get out and he's going to save her. Hmm. Dad's going to get out and he's going to make it all better. He's going to fix everything. And that didn't happen because I was already so far in. I didn't give him a choice. It was either you're coming with me or I'm going. Hmm. 
and he wins. And so we continued to use. Um, I would go to visits and fall asleep. Hmm. Um, that's why they never really stopped doing supervised visits because I would be so exhausted from running as hard and as fast as I was and using it to the extreme that I was that I would sit at a park and they would be talking to me and I would just be Mm. in and out almost of consciousness because I wouldn't sitting down for any period of time would cause me to fall asleep. Wow. So they always needed somebody to supervise the Mm. visitation and then they, they pretty much cut it back to almost nothing. Mm. Joanna had told me, um, I think it was like 11 months in. They were supposed to wait till 15 months. Joanna, in hopes, did it at 11 months, hoping that it would it would affect me enough to do something. Mm. And Joanna is the caseworker? The DCF worker. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I And I fell asleep at her office. I don't know how many times trying to mm-hmm. – she was trying to explain what I needed to do to get them back and talk about visits and in it. I could never stay awake long enough to hold a conversation with her. I didn't know really. I couldn't remember most of the conversations with her, but I knew I didn't like her mm. kind of situation. She had um, texted me and told me that she's filing for a TPR and gave me the court date and mm. basically saying the only way that this goes off the table is if you are in treatment and you need to get a place like it's, it's now or never type of situation. Mm-hmm. So I relayed the message to Brent, and of course we we were angry and frustrated, and we'll show you and and all that type of mentality. And we went right back out and started using. We were away from my dad's house for five days and stumbled in um, on the fifth day. I don't remember how we got there. But I remember Brent kept falling asleep. He he fell asleep sitting on the floor, rested against the oven. And I and I remember waking him up angry because my dad was going to be mad. You can tell that we're high. Mm. He fell asleep trying to take a bath and ended up laying on the floor. My dad had to walk over him to go to the bathroom. Mm. And just, it was really, really awful. Mm. Yeah. And it was the next morning I just said, I'm done. I just... There was nothing left at that point. I can't honestly say that I I stopped using because of my kids because I feel like that would be a lie. Mm. I don't know what put the thought into my head, but in that moment, I was done. I was done. Mm. The night before and the four days before that was just, it was awful. Just like every other time, I had told Brent that I'm going to treatment. I called Serenity House. He called Serenity House. They won't take us both together. Mm. Um, if I didn't go, I risk, if I don't go because Brent can't go, then I risk the TPR. Yeah. If, but I don't want to leave him alone with nothing. Mm. So we went back and forth and we game planned about how we were going to make it work. We tried using two different last names to get into Mm. the same, like everything Mm. to try to make it work the way we wanted to and realizing that it's not going to I went to Serenity House and he was to go to the hospital and tell them that he needs help. Mm. I went to treatment and he did go to the hospital and the hospital said, there's nothing we can do. They Mm. gave him a phone number and sent him out the door. So he essentially got sober in the middle of winter in his mother's basement Wow! while I was in rehab. So yeah, they started letting me have visits at rehab with the kids and, and Brent took it upon himself to go see Joanna and say, look, I can't get into a treatment facility. Let me try it on my own. If I'm not good by the time she gets out, then I will go to treatment myself. Mm. And that's the first time that they really, a connection was made. She honest, she believed him. She trusted Mm. him. And we're not used to those things. Mm. So he did. He sat in his mom's basement and while I was in treatment, And he reached out to a medicated assisted therapy program and he sat in his mom's basement and did that while he was waiting for me to get out. Wow. 
when you were, when was the first time that you experienced a little hope? Like maybe I can, maybe something can be different. Um, hope's dangerous for me. I mm. try not to allow that to be the case. Um, cause sometimes hope gets me into these situations where I hope, hope, hope. And then if it doesn't, I'm crushed. It, mm. it becomes too much. Mm. I, once we got into an apartment, uh, the first apartment from being homeless, there was a little bit of a, of a point where I had positive thoughts about mm -hmm. where things were going and, and how they were heading. Mm. Wow. So you talked about early on, um, well, here, let, I, let me restate this. Um, in the early days when you were really struggling with, with the addiction and just going back to the drugs, um, was it, were you able to at all acknowledge like this isn't good for me or this is wrong or was it kind of no. like you just didn't even see that? And then, but, so you said no at that point. No. Yeah, but there has been a shift since then, right? Of like, and you can oh, yeah. see it, like even in just us talking, the remorse and all that. So do you remember when that shift occurred or started to occur? The first time that it did was realizing I was in rehab. The kids came to visit me and they were talking amongst them, themselves and we were just hanging out and spending time. And the, the two older kids started to talk about how it's Joel's fault and it's DCF's fault. Mm. If it wasn't for them, this. And I remember getting so angry out of nowhere. Because prior to the, all of this, being an addict, one of those things is like, I'm not accountable. It's not my fault. It's your fault. Mm. It's not, I don't use because I want to. I use because I need to be numb because I'm so hurt from X, Y, and Z. And all of these reasons justify my use. Mm. So taking accountability is never something that happens with addiction but when i heard them saying that i got really really angry at them and i had more or less told them it's not dcf's fault it's mm. not joel's fault it's my fault it's not dad's fault it's mm. my fault if you want somebody to blame blame me you're allowed to be angry at me we because we've in depth had that conversation that, that they're always allowed to be angry at me mm -hmm. it's how they handle the situation and so that's probably the first time that it that it actually i actually started taking accountability for things hmm. because i was also blaming dcf i was also blaming joel and i kept seeing this stupid picture that i've seen on facebook before where the mom's tongue going through the child's tongue it's the things that you say mm is the things that they say and they believe. And that's exactly what that was. I spent so much time blaming DCF and Joel and, mm. and this person and that person. So they, they were saying exactly what I, I was saying yeah. and I got to see how absolutely ridiculous it was. Huh? Okay. So you mentioned how your kids said it's Joel's fault and it's DCF's fault. Um, we haven't actually talked about Joel yet, who is the foster dad of the kids. He's the one who his family took in all three of your kids. He took in all three of them okay. so that they would not be separated. Yes. Okay. And Joel had, has really placed a very important, has been a very important person in your life as well. Hasn't he? Yes, now. Now, yes. At the time. It was not that way in the beginning. <laughs> Let's talk about it, that. In the beginning, when I actually, once I got sober and I got out of rehab, had a little bit more of a clear head, had had conversation with my children how it's not Joel, the foster family's fault. It's not DCF's fault. It's my fault. You know, I, I start hearing after this, the kids complaining about different little things with Joel. And of course, every time I hear something that they don't like, I'm getting revved up and I'm getting frustrated. And, and so my focus turns to Joel, mm. this it's him. He's being awful to my kids. He's this, and he's that. 
And then finding out that he was a pastor at a church, <laughs> this is coming. <laughs> aside, addiction aside, there is no, you know, for people who are using, there's not a lot of God and there's not a lot of church for people like me in that in that space at that time. So for me growing up again, religion was never discussed, talked mm. about. I never went to church. I didn't, I couldn't tell you the difference between different mm. religions. Yeah. My husband Brent, however, it was very different. He was forced into being a Catholic. His family was very, very strict in this way. They mm. followed things to a letter. He was sent to a home a home for boys that it was Kern Hatton, I believe. And, and they lead with, with religion in mm. mind. And so that was sense huge and sensitive for him to hear that this man mm. who has our kid is, is a foster or is a, a pastor in a church. So he was very angry. They're going to try to turn our children into really yeah. <laughs> it just it left so many doors open for us to attack Joel and take mm. the focus off us. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, but Joel, he was the kind of guy who really, he didn't give up on you. He actually pursued you too. And then kept pursuing you, right? It wasn't, it wasn't just the kids he pursued and helped. Yes. He continued to try with the kids. I mean, though the older two, they're older, they're set in their ways, they're they're able to protect mom and dad in the way they think is protecting us, hmm. though it wasn't. And so their anger was was pushed at Joel. Joel took a lot. My son was physically hitting him, hmm. kicking him, going out of his way to antagonize because he was very angry and very hurt. Mm -hmm. He didn't want Joel. He wanted mom and dad, and he couldn't have that. So... That's how he processed things. He had a very hard time at Joel's. More to do with him than anything. Mm -hmm. uh, Joel kept trying. He, he kept being patient and trying to understand. And he, he reached out to DCF looking for guidance and help and support mm -hmm. until ultimately the better decision was to, to remove him, Austin, and Heaven as well. Uh, and so... Once that took place, Joel started with offering, you know, if you can have an extra visit if you want to swing by church. We'll be we're, we'll be doing what we do at church, but we don't mind if she comes and sits with you and you guys can see what it is that I do. And you'll get a little bit of, of time with her. Hmm. And so that's how it started. Okay. I still didn't like him. I still was very untrusting, looking for reasons. Um, but we went and we started going every Sunday hmm. and what started out to be, we're only going to see Micaiah to get that extra bit of time turned into Joel asking us to come and have a breakfast without children and to, to be in a, in an open mind, to have an open mind as to what he wanted to say. Hmm. So at that point, that's what we did. We agreed that, okay, we will come listen to what you have to say. Not quite sure if he was going to start trying to preach <laughs> or if he was going to talk about the kids, but pretty certain it had to do with God. <laughs> um, so we went, besides it was free breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we went and that's that's pretty much the conversation that took place. He asked us <laughs> a lot of questions about you know, if God was a part of our households growing up, um, mm. what our thoughts and beliefs were, would we be open to looking at a different perspective, um, making sure we knew that no matter what we decided that day, or even if we didn't decide it that day, that he, he wasn't going to stop talking to us. He wasn't going to to change the way he treated the children or stop bringing them to visits, then absolutely nothing would change either way. But he mm. wanted, he felt really compelled to share what he has with us specifically. Mm. Wow. And so 
it was it was really uncomfortable. I'm not going to lie, because coming <laughs> from a place where I knew nothing about it, yeah. I was very hesitant. I was very untrusting. But because he asked for us to keep an open mind, I, I did. Took us some time of thinking and talking about it and going to church consistently before we made any decisions or commitments to the church. Joel spent time um, coming to our house to do almost like a mentoring. He would read the Bible with mm -hmm. us, explain, you know, we would then openly talk about what we just read and, and our thoughts on that, which was more intimate and easier mm -hmm. for us to let our guard down and not be nervous that people are going to look at us funny because we don't understand something. Yeah. As patient as Joel was, he was also very persistent. <laughs> you know, I could tell very early on once I started to open up and, and not blame him so much. I, I started to see, I'm sorry, give me one second. Sure, that's fine. <laughs> Oops, I think you're still on mute. Actually, you're still on mute, Tiffany. There oh. you go. <laughs> did it unmute or did I even have it muted? You did have it muted. Now you don't. Oh. Now you're back. <laughs> what a matter. I told him to separate. <laughs> yeah, no, it looked very calm. I was impressed. <laughs> Some days. Yeah, I get it. I have children too. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I could tell early on that Joel was super persistent. He also carried himself in a way that let us know without needing to intimidate, without needing to, to assert himself, but you could tell in the way he carried himself that he wasn't in it for me. It wasn't about me. It wasn't about Brent. It was about the kids mm. and it didn't really matter what we liked and what we didn't like about how he did things in his household, that his job was to keep them safe and be supportive of them. And as frustrating as it was in the beginning, I started to understand why. And I started to understand mm. the way he, why he does things the way that he does. It's not his job mm. to be my buddy and my friend, and it's not his job to baby me through this process Though he wants good for us and he is fully supportive of us, the kids is, it was his main mm -hmm. focus and that's what it should have been. Hmm. Wow. Well, there became, there came a time when you started, when you shifted again, right? That you ultimately were like, I am, I am going to work with the process. I am going to work with DCFS and I am going to work with Joel um, and that's really what started the process of changing everything and bringing the kids ultimately back home. Uh, can you talk about this? So um, we had just gotten, um, like I said, we were homeless for a period of time. I would, I was staying in a tent behind Hobby Lobby in Rutland, mm -hmm. and I would walk to the clinic every day to get my medication so that I didn't use that day. And then I had to walk mm -hmm. to my recovery regroup my recovery group, which was an intensive program that needed for me to be there every day for four hours. Hmm. Then we walked to our visits with the kids and then we walked to court and, and all of the things that we needed to do. And at first it, it started out where these are just have tos. We have to do this. We don't have a choice. Hmm. And so that was the mentality. Um, one of the people that I work with had helped me get into an apartment everybody was turning us down because we were both on in the news for being mm. arrested for drugs selling drugs having drugs the whole nine yards and so once we got into the apartment we were able to breathe a little bit and that's when we really started to do this breakfast with joel and start going mm. to church and it started to move very fast at that point because once brent and i started doing all of those things that we were supposed to do, we saw a different side of DCF mm. and a different side of Joel. And they both came to us at different points talking about, you know, 
We want to be supportive. We want to see you succeed. We believe that you can succeed. Hmm. Giving us a little extra here and there when when it was needed. Um, and it was through that support that we were willing to keep going. Hmm. We weren't feeling shut out. We weren't feeling judged. We weren't feeling like failures. They continued to kind of cheer us on from the sidelines letting us know that they're there and that we are doing what we're supposed to do. And, and that takes weight off of us and mm. we no longer feel like we're nothing and we're worthless. Mm -hmm. and, and it's no longer about staying stuck in the mistake that we made, but what we're going to do to not be there. Mm. And it, and it really started moving quickly after that. Wow. It's like this. Joanna became a huge support. Joanna, the DCF worker became a really, really huge support to us. I still talk, even though she's no longer with DCF, I still talk to her today. Mm. And Joel is more family than he is a support mm. or somebody that we speak to. Wow. He still consistently takes my children. Mm. That is so yeah. incredible. I love that. And I think you just made a huge, the the time when you, it turned into not a have to, but like I want to. And mm -hmm. It's like that it started to change. Good. Yeah. And you mm -hmm. start to see success. And just like, really, I would I would guess that just like addiction breeds addiction um, and falling into that. But so does success, right? It breeds success and more success. It does. Yeah. When people are telling you that you're doing it, you might not believe it in the very beginning. But as you start accomplishing the littlest of mm. goals, the little, little, little things, you start to feel a little bit better about who you are and mm. what you are doing. And you get the attention that you're looking for because everybody needs attention. But right. it's not the negative. Don't trust her. Don't speak to her. She's a druggie. She's a this. It, it's no longer mm. that wanting to keep me stuck in in feeling sorry for myself and using it. It's it's more like she's really doing it. She's, mm. she's doing a great job. She's making better choices. And it wants, I want that attention more than yeah. I want the other. So yeah. you try a little bit harder and a little bit harder. Wow. And you are a completely different person than you were then, aren't you? Yep. Uh, who talk, can you speak more to that? Like talk about who you are now versus who you were then. So back in that time, I, I, <laughs> I was a liar. I was a thief. I was a master manipulator. I could convince anybody of pretty much anything and, and they would believe me because I'm little and I'm mm. innocent looking. And, <laughs> and I was an absolute awful, awful person. I didn't care about anything mm. at all. Honestly, even in as hard as it is to admit to, I didn't care about the kids. I didn't care about my husband. I, there was nothing I cared about, but what I wanted in the moment at the time mm. going through this process, I, I've been able to ask harder questions that are kind of easy to answer. What, who am I and what type of person do I want to be? Do I want, do I want to get something accomplished by lying and then feeling guilty about it, or do I want to accomplish it and know that I did it the right way? I went from being just an awful person that nobody could trust, nobody wanted around or liked, to being a person that people come to now looking for the same type of help that I that mm. I needed when I was there. And and it was all of those little things that, you know, interacting with Joel and finding out who I am through, through the church and what the church is to me and, mm. and meeting with Joanna and, and, and all of the, the struggles and, and the little triumphs in there that helped me to hold myself accountable mm. and be able to say, you know what? Yeah. I made some really crappy choices, but I don't have to keep doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. And you have an awesome smile, by the way. <laughs> That's one of the things I lost when I was using. Mm. I lost lots of stuff like that. Yeah, I would imagine. I'm thankful it's back. Um, I, 
I want to ask you one more question, Tiffany. If sure. Joel was sitting here with us right now, what would you say to him? I think I wrote something, honestly, because I mm. just, I could go on and on about Joel some days. Mm. Good, bad, and otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, one of the first things I would tell Joel is that I love him very much. He He is... He went from being this stranger that took my kids to one of my biggest support systems um, in various areas of my life, not just as a preacher and not just as somebody who used to have my children. But Mm. what he did with Micaiah is not something that most people have ever been able to do. And, and and the ways in which he changed our whole dy- her, our whole family dynamic is unimaginable to me. Hmm. Those two have a bond that mom and dad can't touch. Hmm. And I don't think we'll, and we don't want to, we don't need to, but you know, that's part of what led me to put conditions in, in the custody paperwork that Joel would maintain a relationship because to see how it affected him, how this little girl completely took over his whole everything hmm. and how much love he had for her. How, how could you take that away from somebody? Wow. Um, and so I hope that they continue this beautiful relationship that they have. He is her papa and nobody will ever tell her differently. Hmm. She counts the girl, the girls in the house as her sisters and the, and Obi as her brother, it's mama Tate and it's Papa Joel. And, and we're grateful for those things. Mm. They're always there. I could at the spur of a moment call and say, Hey, I need to do something. Can you take one of the kids or I'm having a really rough day and they all help find the solution to that. Mm. Not many people get that type of person. You get friends, you get acquaintances, but yeah, not something like this. Hmm. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And your story is incredible. And it's, it's a hope filled story because as bad as it was, it's, there has been redemption, right? And you are living a whole new life and experiencing things you never thought possible. And that is beautiful. You've actually gained family is what I heard you say through this. Through losing your kids for, sure. for our season, you gained family. Yeah, I wow. really did. And it's a pretty strong one at mm-hmm. that. Our situation is very unique. Mm-hmm. And so I'm now in school trying to finish getting my high school diploma that I didn't get when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. And one of the one of the things I'm striving towards is how to incorporate the, what happened to with my family Mm -hmm. and how it ended and, and how do I, how do I use that to help other families, other foster families and biological parents? Because the ones that lose in the end of all of this, it's not the foster family. It's not the biological parents. Yes. I lost my kids. I deserved that. Mm. They should have been taken. And if, and I almost wish they were taken sooner Mm. to give them a better fighting chance but the mm-hmm. bond that Joel's family and my family have and in what everybody got out of that is not something that happens near often and often. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking to find ways to work with both and help get somewhat of the same outcome. Yeah. Well, the outcome of you even adding legally in paperwork – that they say, I mean, that's, that is not heard of. Yeah, no, I don't think anybody's ever done that before. No, that's pretty crazy. I could not, like, I, I had written it in one of the responses that I, I wrote down for myself to guide me is, you know, I never really looked at their relationship, Micaiah's and Joel's, as anything at all. It was, he was the foster parent and that's it. That's as mm. far as it went. Sometimes I was angry that he was being the parent that I should be, that I'm not in that moment. Other times being grateful that he's there to take care of her, but never did I really see that 
what happened between the two of them until, you know, like DCF had told me they were filing for TPR, mm. you know, and they told Joel to get paperwork and file adoption papers. And he did that. Mm. And so when you make that choice, you're choosing that, okay, this is going to be my child now and I'm going mm-hmm. to love this child. There was no nothing for him. He was told nothing. I showed up at daycare in Proctor mm. to pick her up, to take her home. And he knew nothing about it. Mm. He got a phone call from the daycare saying, hey, it's not her visit day, but she's here to get the kit. She's here to get Micaiah. What do I do? Mm. And when I saw him come flying through that door, the fear on his face was that of what Mm. a real parent, a real dad would be absolutely terrified that somebody's trying to take their child and they're not supposed to. The the amount of fear in his eyes that, wait a minute, why are you here? You're not supposed to be here. Mm. And then when DCF, he called, of course, DCF to verify that, hey, you know, what's going on? And was told that, you know, she's going home. I mean, he mm. the tears streaming down his face that he mm. could not control, that's real. Mm-hmm. That's not made up. That's not just because I'm taking care of her for a little while. That mm-hmm. is, I'm not ready to say goodbye to this little person that I love with all of my heart. I mean, he mm-hmm. loved her like he was her father. Mm-hmm. And how do you take that from a person? Mm-hmm. Because just like he loves her, that little girl, I don't, I don't think her, her life would ever be the same if I took Joel from her. Mm-hmm. He's her papa, her go-to And she loves him just the same. They've got Mm -hmm. this weird little quirky bond of theirs that just is untouchable by Mm -hmm. anybody. And I I couldn't be more grateful. Mm -hmm. I feel weird about that. So I feel like as a mom, I should be jealous. I should be angry. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm not. Mm -hmm. I think it's really awesome. That's. But yeah, it was after that, I couldn't do it. I would have given up and let her stay if it meant the two of them would be okay in that moment. And that's never been the way that I would ever do things. Yeah. Those are my kids. Yeah. But that, that, that's what went through my mind. And instead of hmm. just giving up, I came up with a different solution. Yeah. Make sure he doesn't leave her and, and make sure she doesn't lose him. And so far, it's been amazing. Like I said, they still spend time there. My older kids had a rough time when they were there. Now, they go there all the time. Wow. They're going tomorrow they're, they're, or Saturday because they and their beds are still made from the weekend. Bef- the last mm-hmm. weekend, they were over there. So it's completely turned around. They all love Joel. Wow. All of them. Wow. But that it started is, with those two. It, it absolutely yeah. started with Micaiah and Joel. Wow. Man, I I love that. I love the story of redemption. And I just want to thank you so much. It's not often we get to hear from someone who's had this experience of being a mom who has lost kids into the yeah. system. And so f- your willingness to share the, the hard, the bad, the tough, and the good is really helpful to all of us and it gives us all new fresh perspectives and I hope you feel incredibly blessed for oh I do for your willingness to very do this. blessed and very grateful mm. because it's hard to get your kids back when they go into custody mm. and you hear so many horror stories and having gone through it myself I think I don't think I'd be where I am today if DCF did not take my children and if Joel wow. if they were not placed with Joel you know, there's good and bad in every situation. There's good foster homes. There's bad foster homes. Mm-hmm. There's good workers. There's bad workers. So it really is, a, in a sense, a ch- you're leaving it up to chance, not knowing. Mm-hmm. But I never believed that, well, if you lose your kids to DCF, that's it. You're mm-hmm. never getting them back. Be, and, and they're going to be abused and neglected. Mm-hmm. And, and they're going to have a horrible experience. And all of that was in my brain when they, when mm-hmm. they were taken from me. Having gone through the process... It is what you make it. It yeah. is what you personally make it. Joanna would have wouldn't have been able to convince me different. Joel wouldn't have been able to change the outcome. I had to look at this experience is what I make it. I can make it miserable and horrible for myself and everybody. And I lose my kids anyways. 
or I can utilize the suggestions and, and the resources and I can get everything that I can possibly gain out of the situation and win. Mm. And it, not everybody can do that, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, and that's true in any any part of life. It is, we have personal responsibility, right? Yeah. And and until we recognize that, we're we're going to just keep falling and things aren't going to, you know, we're just not going to find any growth. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Well, Tiffany, I have thoroughly enjoyed our time together and I am so thankful for your willingness to share your time with us and share your experiences. So thank you so much for being on today. Well, thanks for having me. Well, I hope that today's episode encouraged you wherever you are on your foster care journey. We want you to stay connected, so be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you will never miss an episode. Also, we have great content at theforgotteninitiative.org. Thank you for watching. I cannot wait to be with you next time.